Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's 28th virtual YMCA Education Series program with the North Suburban YMCA. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I'm a personal trainer and the adult program coordinator at the North Suburban YMCA in Northbrook, Illinois. We are recording this evening's presentation so that you will be able to revisit it again. Please feel free to tell your family and friends about it so that they too can view it on either the IBJI or NSYMCA websites down the road. Dr. Jordan Goldstein and Dr. Albert Knuth will be hosting tonight's program entitled Sports Medicine for All Ages. Whether you injure yourself during exercise or while playing a sport, you want to get back to feeling good and able to do your normal everyday activities as soon as possible. We know that too much too soon at too great of an intensity can lead to injury. However, we also know that sitting and doing nothing can have adverse effects on our bodies as well. The sports medicine team at IBJI strives to enable people of all ages to enjoy an active lifestyle and offers a coordinated approach to prevention, diagnosis, and treatment options available for athletes of all ages and skill levels. Dr. Goldstein and Knuth are both part of that IBJI sports medicine team, and tonight they bring you a conversation about the team's coordinated approach. Jordan Goldstein, MD, is a board certified orthopedic surgeon with fellowship training in sports medicine. Dr. Goldstein has been recognized with hospital distinctions for his compassion and excellence in care of his patients and prides himself on having the highest standards of respect and ethics for his patients. His goal is your goal, improved function, less pain, and a better quality of life. Dr. Goldstein specializes in the treatment of shoulder, elbow, and knee conditions with advanced arthroscopic shoulder and knee ligament reconstructive techniques, shoulder replacement, and cartilage restoration. He does procedures such as arthroscopic rotator cuff repair of the shoulder, meniscal treatment, and ACL reconstruction of the knee on an outpatient basis, which minimizes post-operative pain, increases the potential for rehabilitation, and can lead to a quicker recovery. While completing his fellowship at Emory University in Atlanta, Dr. Goldstein served as assistant team physician for Emory University baseball and basketball, as well as Georgia Tech football, basketball, and baseball teams. He is a former junior national tennis player and still enjoys getting out on the court, as well as spending time with his wife and two sons. Dr. Goldstein's lists of research publications, as well as his list of affiliations, associations, awards, and appointments not to mention his teaching accolades would take up the most of the rest of this hour. However, if you want to read all about his qualifications, please check him out on the IBJI website. Albert Knuth, MD, is a board certified orthopedic surgeon with fellowship training in pediatric orthopedic surgery. Dr. Knuth specializes in pediatric orthopedics, limb lengthening, and reconstructive surgery, and his special interests are pediatric fracture care, club foot, scoliosis, and limb length inequality. Dr. Knuth has been recognized for his compassion and excellence in the care of his patients as well. Says Dr. Knuth, as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, I have to really think about the kid and the parent, not just one. Most of the time, the parent is sitting there next to us thinking with their heart. So I tell them what our plan is intellectually, but also make sure that I am addressing their worries and concerns so that we can move forward united. He further explains, I went into medicine with the thought that intellect would get you, that skills would get you places, and learned early that it's actually the human part that gets you the results you want. As a father of six children and foster father to many more, Dr. Knuth prides himself in understanding the parent-child relationship and its impact on medical care. His one and only goal is to provide the finest quality of pediatric and adolescent orthopedic care in a comfortable, and caring environment. Dr. Knuth has been practicing in the Northwest suburbs of Chicago since 1998. He enjoys spending time with his wife and six kids and is an avid sports fan and likes his rock and roll music. Thank you again for joining us this evening. And thank you, Dr. Jordan Goldstein and Dr. Albert Knuth for your time and effort in putting together this program to help us understand more about treating athletic children, teens, and adults in sports medicine for all ages. Now, Dr. Knuth, please take it from here. Thank you for the kind introduction. 
Uh, the one thing that Dr. Well, several things Dr. Goldstein and I share together is a passion for getting people better. Uh, we're also pretty hyper, so buckle up. It's going to go quick. <laughs> I always start off with summary, and to me, there's so many uh, injuries that we'd be here all night if we tried to do it. I kind of joke it's taken me 25 years to uh, figure out how to do it. Uh, so in 20 minutes, we're going to kind of stay general. Uh, but when we look at things right now, our current state of uh, childhood or um, youth sports, there are more sports injuries now than there ever have been, and there are less children participating. Uh, some sobering facts, 70% of 13-year-olds have stopped playing um, sports with a greater than 20% middle and high school obesity rate. Uh, there really needs to be an effort to put the play back into playing sports. Um, we need to emphasize effort even more than participation uh, and definitely more than results. Uh, we have seen, especially in our area, a sports specialization and year-round participation that is leading to overuse. And while it's good for business, it's not necessarily best for the kid. Um, and I always kind of try to have the fact that when there's only six or seven percent of high school athletes that will play at the college level with less than two percent D1 athletes, and only about one in 58 of these people will receive any money, we kind of have to ask ourselves, what are we doing this for? And what is our goal? Another sobering fact, even if you do make it to college, only one or 2% of those people will actually ever make any money uh, in a living doing it. Um, so starting at the beginning, why should my child participate? Um, in general, children want to have fun, they want to learn skills, and they want to be with their friends. It's very, very straightforward when they start in the five, six, seven years of age. As they get older, they get a little bit more competitive and then like to test their abilities against others uh, and participate for the excitement of the game. Also, it has been shown multiple times that youth sports uh, participation have higher levels of physical activity that positively influence their physical and psychosocial health in adolescence and even later life. One of the biggest things is the academic performance, and there are multiple studies that show uh, uh, co athletic, sorry, college athlete females' uh, academic performances are significantly higher than non-athletic counterparts. Uh, but there is the physical health, the social well-being, health behaviors that extend even to people like me at 56 years of age. Um, so it is known that these help. Um, Again, we want to increase somebody's self-confidence and self-esteem. There is a um, uh, something we call competence motivation, and I think all of us have it, but it's when you try something and if you're able to do it and you can do it and show competence, you're motivated by your success and then it increases. So we must kind of remember that when we're, when we're teaching kids or we're coaching kids that you want to make it you want to increase their uh, activities based upon what they can accomplish because if it's too hard, they won't do it. Um, you need to keep them moving uh, straight forward. Um, children will perceive that the activity is fun and will continue provided there are more positive than negative experiences. And that's something that we harp on all the time. You kind of have to have fun uh, to continue to play. Sometimes people need to win to have fun, but a lot of people need to have fun and then they will win. Um, one of the biggest things we've seen, especially with the sedentary uh, uh, middle school and high school children, is we're already seeing health issues that are beyond the playing field, more the inactivity uh, of our youth. Um, and there's multiple studies that will show that if you participate as a youth, those regular exercise habits continue into adulthood and hopefully help because we all know the older you are, the harder it gets. Um, so with all these positives and everything that we know is good, um, why has there become an emphasis on competitive success? Why has this resulted in increased pressure to begin high intensity training at such a young ages? And with all these excessive focus on intensive training, competition at younger ages rather than skill development has led to that 70% uh, burnout rate or overuse injuries by the time they're in middle school. Um, some physiologic factors that I like to educate people on is that uh, children are not little adults. Dr. Goldstein has the adult talk, uh, but kids, just their bodies are decidedly different. Um, so for us, you can't 
treat a kid as a little adult. Um, they will talk a little bit uh, next couple slides in more detail, but they lack kind of the complex motor skills to do some of the stuff that seems so straightforward to the uh, to the coaches. Uh, they they lack the motor skills. They lack some of the uh, brain development and the coordination and balance to actually do the skills that come easy to us. Other things for us is that they're a growing child, um, definitely during the school, uh, sorry, the uh, school age and even into high school, where one year they can be five, six, and the next year they can be five, 10. And there are significant changes in length and mass that change with age that can lead to uh, worsening injuries. One of the biggest things for us is when we look at things, the limb length will increase about one and a half times as you go from a child to an adolescent, but the limb mass, meaning the size circumference in the muscle is three times. And we see a lot of mismatches which lead to this musculoskeletal imbalance. So the five or six year old kid is decidedly different machine than the 15 year old. And we sometimes don't take into account uh, uh, that. Uh, biggest thing too, we always talk is that children have open growth plates and those are usually, can be the weak link to an injury. And that's something that the adults just don't have to worry about. Uh, these are just a couple slides that I always think is nice and you try to teach people depending upon where you're coaching. And I, I um, whatever, maxed out at the t-ball level. Uh, but ultimately, the average two or five-year-old kid who's playing t-ball does not have an attention span, does not have vision, does not have the balance skills uh, to do advanced skills. So we're supposed to be helping them with running and swimming and tumbling and maybe catching and throwing. Now, we all know somebody, when I was a t-ball coach, Joey was five, and Joey could have been playing in the uh, you know, professional minor leagues. He was that good where we were scared for all the other kids on the field. So there's always exceptions, but in general, the 90-plus percent rule, you kind of want to try to apply it to make it age appropriate. As we start getting into the six- to nine-year-olds, that's when, again, the attention span is improving but still limited. Vision is basically improving, so you can start some entry-level baseball, you can start entry-level soccer, uh, but in general, it is, again, the rare individual that has enough posture and balance uh, to do everything uh, that the uh, adolescent or pre-adolescent does. Once you start coaching the 10 to 12-year-olds, the fourth, the sixth graders, and on, in general, their transitional skills are good enough that they have the ability to master more of the complex skills um, and uh, adult patterns of vision. And this is when you can really emphasize skill development. Um, and it's also when we start to see a lot of the overtraining because the child will, uh, will be all in. A busy slide, so I'll just kind of have a couple things here. But more than 3.5 million kids under 14 receive medical treatment for sports injuries each year. And this study was actually from about 10 years ago, so it's going to be higher. Uh, as it, well, it was a little bit lower for COVID, but it's going to be higher. We believe that overuse injuries are responsible for nearly half of all the sports injuries to the middle and high school students. And if you look at the CDC, they believe that more than half of all the sports injuries are preventable. Um, the last, again, sobering thing we always talked about is by age 13, 70% of kids have dropped out of youth sports. And when you ask the three reasons why, it's adults, coaches, and parents. So it is so hard to try to, the balance of wanting your kid to do well, providing everything for your kid to do well, but then yet not pushing them to the point where they don't have fun, are burned out over use injuries, and then leave the sport. Um, again, very busy slide, but it just, there's multiple um, uh, studies right now that talk about sports specific stuff. So uh, this one is specifically to gymnasts and I like quoting it because they looked at level four to 10 gymnasts. They looked at a thousand hours of participation which if uh, the kids are averaging 20 hours a week, which seems like a lot, but it's not, uh, uh, not too much for some of the people that we take care of, that they will have 1.3 injuries for every thousand hours and 1.8 overuse injuries every thousand hours. 
So I kind of tell the parents, if your kid's a gymnast 20 hours a week, you're gonna see somebody like me three times a year. I think this kind of puts into perspective a little bit on what, what you're getting into, because I think a lot of us, even the doctors at times, are surprised uh, by the amount of injuries and how sometimes quickly overuse injuries can happen when we truly have well-intended coaches, parents, uh, and trainers. So there's multiple studies, sport specific, that kind of help us understand what are we getting into so you can try to mediate. Um, one of the big differences for me with taking care of children uh, is what gets hurt. The adolescents, the adults, most of us are more soft tissue stuff, muscle, tendon, ligaments. Kids, and we'll talk a little bit about it, kids really have troubles more with bones and growth plates. Um, so that's what we worry most about, fractures or stress fractures. And again, another busy slide, but if you look at the y-axis is bone mass. So obviously the, the stronger the bone, the higher it is. And then we look at ages of life. So for the first 25 years, your bone mass increases from 25 to 40 of plateaus, and then it starts to drop. So I always tell families when they're surprised that their six or eight-year-old broke a bone, if you look at the six and eight-year-old on the way up, and you extrapolate it out here, we have about a 75-year-old female. So if a kid is at a trampoline and gets hurt at a third grade birthday party, parents are frustrated. And I joke and say, would you ever, would you ever have had grandmother's birthday party at the same place because they have the same strength of bone? So by the time you get to the adolescence and the adulthood, you start having ligament troubles, but the people down here have bone troubles. Um, again, muscle injuries, and Dr. Goldstein will get into it a little bit more. Uh, the biggest thing that we see with the kids with muscle injuries, we believe is improper warm up and then fatigue. It's always, well, I'm gonna do one more run, one more something, uh, and that's usually when something happens. So if somebody is fatigued, you wanna be careful about pushing it farther. There's always the idea more is better, and sometimes the fatigue is the, the coach's way of saying shut down, we'll come back and play again. Um, we look at overuse injuries, and this is a significant portion, probably 25% of what the pediatric uh, sports medicine orthopedist deals with. Um, and basically for us, it is um, extremely common. Um, the muscle overload or what we call repetitive microtrauma without the body's ability to kind of repair itself, causes the collagen uh, fibril to slide, and that's basically the muscle soreness and the intrinsic damage that if you go at it the next day, things worsen. The biggest thing, as we said too for us, are stress fractures because the bone just isn't strong enough to take the physiologic loading that it would be if they were 18 or 25. Um, this is, again, another slide that I think is, is great to try to understand um, and we talk about workload uh, for the child. And we think of frequency, intensity, and duration of training, but there's also a big uh, amount of life responsibilities that come into some of these high school kids. So in general, if you're, the more you work, uh, in general, you will be here. There is some ability to what we call overreach, and this is kind of uh, stressing the body a little bit, but you need to recognize when you're here to take time off, and then you can get a peak where it goes up, where most of us try to push through the overreaching and end up in the overtraining. And then we actually end up with decreased fitness uh, because of too much. So more is not better. Uh, risk factors uh, for us, you really want the child to have two to three months of rest from an activity. You can play three sports and you can play year round, but you don't want a single sport more than about nine to 10 months a year. You don't want really greater than five to six days a week. And in general, a rule is if you're more active in organized sports hours per week than years per life, uh, you could run into trouble. So the 12 year old gymnast really shouldn't be spending much more than 12 hours a week at the gym. And sometimes that can be difficult. We also have to be cognizant of the two teams where somebody's playing house and then they're playing travel because uh, sometimes coaches don't know who's getting the time on the field. Another big thing for us is prior injuries. If there's been an overuse injury, 
that usually means psychologically and or physically the child is going to take risks. Growth spurts for us, the sixth, seventh grade girls, the eighth, ninth grade boys, a very difficult time uh, in injuries increase. So you need to be more careful there. And that's usually when the competition gets cranked up. Any female who is amenorrheic or not having periods, uh, that can be a significant nutritional uh, uh, deficit and risk factor for stress fractures. Um, the reason I showed up today and the reason I hope people are listening is we need to kind of identify these risk factors to try to prevent things. It's so much easier to take a couple weeks off and get better than it is to have a permanent problem and be out of a sport at a young age. Sometimes part of my job is to mediate between the parent, the athlete, the coach, but a lot of it is to educate people because once we know these risk factors, most people are understanding and truly have the uh, athlete's uh, um, uh, interest at their best heart. Um, again, this is just a, a, a different, uh, different way of looking at it. I always advise kind of weekly training time, especially if you're coming back from a, an injury, you really don't want to increase more than about 10% per week. And you will be very surprised if you talk to your high school athletes that they tend not to really have a preseason. Many of them have to show up and be ready to go with the first practice. So if somebody hasn't, hasn't prepared preseason, uh, you'll see the 10% each week go 50 and 100%. And there can be a lot of, uh, a lot of injuries that happen two to four weeks after the season starts because they can't keep up. Um, again, Lastly, and again, busy slides, but general fitness is essential for us. We talk about weight training. Weight training is good form, three to five sets, eight to 12 reps, and it doesn't matter if you do three pounds or 3,000 pounds. Weight lifting is what kind of fills the weight rooms and did for me in the 80s. And that's basically how much can I max out so I can get my name on a board uh, to feed the ego. That actually is not good for, for the kids, especially when they're growing, that in, uh, we have a higher risk injury and it's not sports performance. It's basically a YouTube video on how, uh, how strong you were. If there is uh, an injury, we want to tell somebody that feeling good does not equal healed good. Usually after three, five, seven days, the sw swelling, the pain, the inflammation are better. And that's phase one. Once the kid feels good, they will go back as opposed to truly having uh, pain-free motion strength and then going through functional drills, endurance, agility, which is phase two, to make sure that when they return to play, they're healed and not just ping-ponging from I'm hurt to I think I could go back, but oh, I'm hurt again because I shouldn't have gone back. Uh, lastly is the slide that we saw at the beginning. Again, more sports injuries despite less people participating. Why are 13 year olds uh, quitting? And what can we do to try to make it fun to hope that they continue to be active into their 40s, 50s, 60s so that Dr. Goldstein gets a chance to fix different injuries. So always ask yourself when you're the coach or when you're the parent, what is the goal? Because I think that helps us more uh, to prevent the injuries than anything. Uh, additional information, I think it's great. Uh, AAOS is American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, Pediatric Orthopedic Society in North America, StopSportsInjuries.org, and then a good book, Just Let Them Play, I think is a great thing for people to know. So I appreciate your attention. I hope I did not take too long, uh, and I'm more than uh, happy to answer questions when Dr. Goldstein is done. Thank you. All right. Dr. Knuth, that's a great overview, great talk, a lot of good points there to learn from. Can you guys all see my slides? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to talk about um, two topics that I get asked about all the time, even um, when I'm not at work and just from friends and family, and I think it'll be ap applicable to this audience. And um, I'm going to take you to orthopedic medical school in 20 minutes and talk about two topics that hopefully you'll learn something about. And um, may generate some questions and hopefully I can answer. So one of those topics I get asked about all the time is rotator cuff tears. And so let's talk about it. What, what exactly is the rotator cuff? The rotator cuff is actually four muscles. There's one in the front, subscapularis, there's one in the top, the supraspinatus, and there's two in the back, the infraspinatus and the teres minor. 
and those muscles act in conjunction to help stabilize your shoulder joint and move your shoulder. And without that, you can develop pain and weakness in your shoulder. So what is a rotator cuff tear? Well, you can see in this diagram here, there's a tear in this tendon right here. This would be the supraspinatus. And what does that look like in an MRI? Everyone says, you know, we have an MRI, there's a tear, but you know, it all looks like gibberish to me. Well, here's the supraspinatus, and I'm gonna follow that tendon here. And what you can see is there's some white here, there's some fluid here, and there, there's a gap there. This tendon edge should be down to here, and that's a rotator cuff tear. And what does that look like arthroscopically? Well, you can kind of see here, this is a probe from surgery, and this whole area is the tendon here, and that tendon should be down onto the bone. So that's what it looks like when we're actually looking at it to try to fix it. So that's what a rotator cuff tear looks like. Well, what do we know? Rotator cuff tears are very common. By the age of 60, a significant portion of people have them. Now, do we have to fix every rotator cuff tear? No, I'm gonna get into that, we do not. But a lot of people will have rotator cuff tears and not even know it. And if you have no pain with a rotator cuff tear, I'm not gonna make you better than no pain. So that's something to keep an eye on. We're gonna get into that in a second. But generally we talk about degenerative tears and traumatic tears. And degenerative tears are tears that happen with age. The tissue quality becomes poor. Um, it, um, it doesn't hold and, the, and it, the tear happens over time and it's a slow process. Whereas a traumatic tear is, hey, my shoulder was feeling great. I was, had no problems. And all of a sudden, I was involved in a car accident, or I fell on my shoulder, or I got knocked down, and now I can't move my arm, and it hurts. So those tears are treated differently. Um, on the traumatic side, we try to fix those pretty quickly. Where in the degenerative side, we have some time to play whether or not we treat that conservatively, or we fix that surgically. Um, it goes without saying, the larger the tear, the loss, the greater the loss of function. So the smaller the tear, the better. The larger the tear, the worse. And that can impact of how we treat, how we treat people as well. So what, what else do we know? Well, if you have a full tear, rotator cuffs tears do not heal on their own. So that's an important point. It's not so much that the tear doesn't heal, but what we're concerned about is that the tear can get larger over time. And studies have shown that that does happen. We can't tell you for sure whether that happens at one year, two years, or five years, but in generally, we, there's some studies that show that if it's gonna happen, it usually happens within two years. And the important point to that is that if it gets larger, and it becomes bigger and retracted and pulled back farther, it becomes more difficult to repair and your recovery or your function after the repair may be compromised. So there are other times where patients don't have rotator cuff pain at all. They have a rotator cuff tear, but I got no pain. In those situations, again, we're gonna watch those patients, but we have to keep an eye on them because a lot of those patients will eventually have pain and we have to, we have to follow them along. How do you know if things are getting worse? Well, if you have increasing pain or decreased strength, that's something to, that may portend that your tear is getting larger. So how do we treat rotator cuff tears? Well, obviously there's non-operative treatment that, can, that includes anti-inflammatory medications, physical therapy, and injections. And we utilize this for a couple of patient populations, the low demand population, people who are not using their arms a lot. If they're um, an elderly population of 70, 80, or 90, and they're not, you know, they're, um, they're just doing everything below shoulder height and they're comfortable, that's one possibility. Um, if the tear is so big and so massive that I don't think I can repair it, um, that may be another possibility. Or in patients that are degenerative tears and tears that have been going on for a while, we have a little wiggle room of trying non-operative treatments and following them along. However, age is a relative term. I know many 60 and 70 year olds who are doing activities that a 40 and 50 year old. Um, on the opposite level, I know a lot of 60 year olds who are functioning like 80 or 90 year olds. So it's not the absolute age, it's the physiologic age that we talk about. So what are these patients doing? And if they're fairly active and the tissue quality is good and I think I can repair it, I think that the patients will have a better function and better outcome um, from a surgical perspective than a conservative perspective. So those are, there's the art of science, I mean, there's the art of medicine, and there's the science of medicine, and both of those come into play um, when evaluating a patient and determining whether or not you're gonna, we're gonna go a surgical route or we're gonna go a conservative, conservative route. So how do we fix this? Well, we usually do this arthroscopically. We could do this through small incisions, which I'm gonna show you. It's an outpatient basis, and patients do very well, and, and it, gives that, it gives it an opportunity for the tendon to heal. So what makes it more difficult? Well, you know, smoking can affect the tissue quality and the healing process. So if you're a smoker, that could affect your outcomes. 
you're diabetic that can affect your outcomes. And obviously, the larger the tear is, the, the higher the risk of complications are. So we still fix a, a lot of larger massive tears, and they do very well, but your risk for uh, functional outcome um, is, is greater in those situations than with smaller tears. Um, we, there's revision surgeries where patients have, a, have had surgery and they've torn once and they come back to me and they say, hey, listen, I've had a surgery before and, and, it's, uh, and my shoulder's been bothering me and we work it up and they have a re-tear. And so in those situations, we can fix those again. But again, um, those are challenging situations that, that may affect the outcomes as well. And there's been some, some studies that have shown that multiple cortisol injections can affect the tissue quality. So I'm not saying cortisol injections are bad. I give them, I give them quite a lot for um, rotator cuff pathology, but we got to keep uh, an eye on how many we're giving and, and what type of patient we're giving in. So if I have a patient who's got a full tear of the rotator cuff and I know I'm going to do surgery within a few months, I am not giving them a, I'm not giving them a cortisol injection. Whereas if I have a 75 or 80 year old patient who's had the rotator cuff tear for years and they're getting by and they're feeling okay and they really don't want to undergo surgery, those, are, those patients will probably get a cortisol injection. So how do we fix arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs? So these are done through small holes in the shoulder, and we do this underwater, and we have these tiny instruments, these cameras, and these um, um, graspers and, and, and implants that we're able to utilize through these small incisions to fix um, the rotator cuff. And basically, what you can see here is there's an anchor that goes into the bone. We do this through these small incisions, and that anchor has sutures that thread through the tendon, and then we can tie it back down. We tie that tendon right back down. So you can kind of see the tendons off the bone, and we tie it back down here. And you can kind of see that final result there. And that's kind of what it looks like. And so the surgery, um, you know, I, I've done this for over a decade, and, and I can, you know, I've handled very complex situations. And I always tell the patient, the surgery is not the hard part. It's the rehab is the hard part. And so you're in a shoulder sling for about six weeks. Um, and depending on how big the tear is, you're either starting therapy at uh, three weeks or six weeks. But for the first six weeks, you're in a shoulder sling. And then after that, we work on range of motion um, with therapy, we active and passive, but no weights. And phase three, we're getting more strengthening. And I tell my patients, it could be six months up until full recovery, but patients usually do pretty well. They're feeling pretty good at the two to three month mark, but it could be up to six months for full recovery. Um, what are the complications with rotator cuff repair? Well, stiffness, infection, arthritis, a lot of the complications I listed here are pretty rare. The one you have to be careful about is a rotator cuff re-tear, and that can range anywhere from you know, 10 to 70%, and that risk of a re-tear um, depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the tissue quality, the size of the tear, the age of the patient, the quality of the bone. But what we know is that patients who have had re-tears of rotator cuff um, surgery actually still do better than having not had surgery at all. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So we're gonna talk about a different topic now um, that, was, that didn't uh, joggle your brain cells. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna spin around to meniscus injuries and go to the knee. And this is another topic I get asked about all the time. I try to pick out two topics that you know, patients will ask me about in the lay field and say, hey, you know, do I have a rotator cuff tear? Do I have a meniscus tear? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about meniscus injuries and how you treat them. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about anatomy here. What is the meniscus? Well, the meniscus acts as a bumper between the two bones. And you can see you have two meniscus here. You have one on this side and you have one over here. You can kind of see this little top-down view. This is one meniscus right here. This is another meniscus right here. And it acts as a bumper between the two bones. And the important point of this slide here is that you can see that there's a vascular there's vessels in this meniscus. The meniscus comes all the way here and all the way here. And you can kind of see there's vessels within the meniscus here. The important slide, point of this slide is there's vessels within one third of the meniscus. So if I cut it here, there's vessels. The rest of the meniscus has no vessels. And so why, why is that important? Well, that will help delineate our treatment if we end up needing surgery, whether we trim the meniscus out or we fix it. And we try to tend to fix meniscus in the areas of tears that have the vessels. If there's no blood vessels here, those meniscus tears are unlikely to heal or less likely to heal. So that's the important part of that slide. Um, as I talk about what's the main purpose of these meniscus, again, it acts as a bumper. It's a load-bearing structure. It helps protect the cartilage in your knee from the top of the knee to the bottom, so the, the femur and the tibia. And those bones are, are covered with cartilage, and the, and the meniscus helps protect it. It also helps the knee glide. The other, the other thing that the meniscus do 
is it helps stabilize your knee. We talk about the ACL and the PCL and all these ligaments that help stabilize the knee, but the meniscus acts as a stabilizing structure as well. So not all meniscus tears are the same. You can see from the slide, there's a bunch of different meniscus tears present, uh, the type of tear and what it looks like. And it's not only the tears we're looking at, we're looking at the, the age of the patient. How do these tears happen? Were they acute? Were they, have they been going on for a long time? Do these patients participate in a lot of sports? And all these factors will affect treatment. So it's not just, hey, I have a meniscus tear. Do I need to, take, do I need to have surgery? It, it doesn't look like that. It's, you have to take a look at, do they have a meniscus tear? How long has it been there? Where's the pain at? Is the pain even being caused by the meniscus tear? Um, and so, and is this tear fixable? Is this tear, or do, we, or do we trim this out? Or can we treat this conservatively? So an acute tear is much more common in patients uh, who are younger, while degenerative tears are more common in older patients. That, that kind of goes makes sense. Um, acute tears happen from trauma, where degenerative tears can happen over time. And so we take a history and physical on these patients. You know, I can talk about how did this tear happen? How long have you been having this tear? and certain mechanisms that cause the tear. Um, and do they have pain? Do they have locking? Do they have, do they have um, a swelling on the knee? These are all factors that go into determining whether or how I'm gonna treat these patients. Cause you can't, it's not just you have a meniscus tear, you have to take the whole story, um, yeah, whole story into, in, in, into value to see how you're gonna treat these patients. So we also do a physical examination. Um, we, we range the knee, we palpate the knee, we kind of get a sense of where the pathology is in the knee. And certain, med, certain exam findings will be consistent with meniscus pathology, while certain other ones may lead me down a different pathway. And so this is a good example. Not all pain on, the, on your knee is a meniscus tear. So if someone comes to me with meniscus pain, the meniscus is down here, it's actually pretty normal. But what, look at this divot here. You guys see this clear divot. That's a big hunk of char cartilage that's gone from what we call the femoral condyle. And that produces pain on the inside part of your knee. So not all pain on the, in the, within the inside part of the knee is meniscus. We kind of have to get a sense of what is causing the pain. So how do we do this? We take x-rays, we do physical exam findings, uh, we take the history, and we also get an MRI. And so we can kind of get a sense of what things look like. The important part to this slide is that two things I want to highlight in the slide. Number one, not all meniscus tears are painful. There are a lot of people out there, a significant portion of patients who are greater than 45 or 50 years old who run marathons and they say, my knee feels great. And I take an MRI on them and they have a meniscus tear. Do we operate them? Do we have to fix them? No, they feel great. I can't make you better than zero pain. So just because you have a meniscus tear doesn't mean we have to do anything. It has to do with the fact of, again, do they have pain? Do they have a history of trauma? Is it causing pathology? The other important part of the slide is if you have symptomatic arthritis, you almost surely have a meniscus tear. When the cartilage is gone in the knee, and then the meniscus is almost certainly damaged. And a meniscus is not the source of the pain in that situation. It's your arthritis that, that is the source of the pain. So you gotta know what you're treating. How do we treat this? Well, again, multiple ways to do this. Conservative, meniscectomy, which means trimming out a portion of the meniscus, meniscus repair, or meniscal replacement, which is um, a pretty rare thing, but we can do these in younger individuals who have had a complete loss of their meniscus. And there are a lot of variables that go into this. Like I said, is it acute? Is it traumatic? Um, do they have pre-existing arthritis? Are their ligaments intact? So there's a lot of variables that go into determining how we're treating meniscus tears. I always get patients that come to me and say, I have a meniscus tear, I need surgery. And I said, whoa, hold, let's back off. Let's see what, let's see what things look like. And not all meniscus tears need surgery. So conservative treatment, we talk about ice, anti-inflammatory medications, working on physical therapy, steroid injections. These are all ways to treat this conservatively. Um, get a good examination. If I'm unsure about it, I'm going to get an MRI. And so for a meniscectomy, what you can see here is, sorry, let me move my mouse. There's a tear right here in the meniscus. You can see that right here. And what we did is we trimmed it out. And we kind of took a biter and a grass when we trimmed that out. And the important point here is we want to, we want to salvage as much of the meniscus as possible. You only take out what you need to because we want to keep that meniscus there as a joint preservation um, bumper that it is and help protect the cartilage. Most patients do very well with meniscectomies. Um, they have excellent results. However, you gotta, you gotta forewarn patients that if a patient has pre-existing arthritis, I say, listen, hey, you may still have some pain even after we deal with your meniscus because you have some arthritis in that knee. And so the arthroscopy for meniscectomy or dealing with the meniscus does not fix the pain associated with arthritis in the knee. Um, what's the rehab? Most patients do very well and recover from this surgery pretty quickly. 
Um, they're back to work within a week or two if it's a desk job. And I tell my athletes they're usually back to sports within six weeks. So they, they work on range of motion pretty quickly. They're on a bike very quickly. And the rehab is fairly, um, fairly quick on these procedures. Well, a meniscal repair is a little bit different. You saw them in the meniscectomy, we're trimming out that meniscus. But a meniscal repair is when we're fixing the meniscus with sutures. And again, we have to try and find that specific type of tear that is repairable by, by fixing it with sutures. And how do we do that? We thread these little devices with sutures through the meniscus. And you can kind of see we're tying that down, we're kind of closing off that tear. And there's multiple ways to do that, multiple ways to skin a cap, but in general, um, this, is, this is the process of how we're fixing a meniscus um, um, with sutures. And the complication rate is pretty low. There's, you know, there's some risk of nerve issues, but again, it's pretty, pretty low. The, the question is, do they actually heal when we fix them? And again, it depends on where we're fixing this meniscus. We want to fix them in the vascular zone. We want to try and give them the optimal environment to, to be fixed. And age is a dependent factor. The type of tears is a dependent factor. So we're careful about how we're choosing um, what meniscus we're fixing and what meniscus we're taking out. Um, the rehab on the meniscal repairs is, is, is quite different, actually. So um, you're walking with your legs straight for about six weeks in a brace. Um, you're working on progressive exercises, and the rehab is much slower for a meniscal repair than a meniscectomy. I tell my athletes they're back to sports within about four months after a meniscus repair. That's about that's a lot different than six weeks after a meniscectomy. So a lot of my young kids will say, hey, I just take it out and link it back to sports quicker. But I tell them in the long run for your life, it's better to try to repair it if possible um, to preserve as much function of that meniscus um, and to preserve your cartilage. And so, again, um, we talk about getting back to play in about four or six months. Um, finally, I'm briefly going to just touch back on meniscal replacement. Quick couple slides. Not a common procedure, but in patients who have had a, to a subtotal meniscectomy, which is a good portion of the meniscus removed, um, and it's non-functional, and they're young, and the ligaments are intact, um, there is a procedure that can be done called a meniscal replacement, and it is useful to help prevent and help with pain associated um, after taking out the entire meniscus. It does not it's not as much for function, but more for pain. And it's a technically difficult procedure. Um, you wanna to go to someone who's done a, um, a decent amount of them. Um, there's a lot of unanswered questions, but again, it's for patients um, for pain control and not for return for athletics. But again, that's a pretty rare procedure. Um, in general, um, you know, I, I hope, hopefully you got something out of this lecture on the meniscus side for the meniscectomy and the meniscal repair, because I think those are much, much more common procedures um, that you will see um, both for you and your family. And so um, hopefully we kind of flew through a little bit of a medical school, at least orthopedic medical school for you guys. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to um, answer anything. Um, I know that was kind of quick and a lot of information, but by the way, if there's any questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Goldstein, and thank you, Dr. Knuth. Dr. Knuth, if you want to come back on and join us, that would be great. I have a list of questions for you here, so uh, we will go ahead and get started. There's Dr. Knuth. Okay, because the first one's for you, Dr. Knuth. Ooh. Do you always recommend physical therapy for children? Uh, yes and no. To me, a, a, the analogy I use frequently is a therapist is like a teacher. They can tell you what to do, but ultimately the, the child, the adolescent needs to do the homework. And if you just go to therapy once a week uh, and you don't really put the time and energy in between the visits, um, then sometimes we're just checking a box as opposed to getting a lot out of it. So I always say if the patient is motivated, you can learn really quickly and you really don't need prolonged therapy because it's are you doing it, not necessarily who is watching you when you do it. So it's I use it frequently, but not in everybody. Okay, okay, great. Uh, and another one for you, Dr. Knuth. Do you know of any local youth sports leagues where where they emphasize fun versus competition? Uh, with six kids, um, it, you have to drive if that's what you want, because ultimately for us, it is getting farther and uh, sorry, farther and fewer uh, in uh, between. So the answers are for us, we've gotten a little bit lucky. I live out in the Northwest suburbs, the Palatine Inverness area, and you can still find it. But one of my kids isn't playing this summer because they didn't have enough people sign up for the league that had gone on for 15 years prior. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's a, it's not a good thing to have where it is basically all or nothing and people are travel because there isn't the fun rec leagues 
Uh, even some of it is going into the, uh, you know, the uh, lower than or less than the junior high school. And that's just so it's it's a problem. So I don't yeah. really know of, uh, you know, it's hit or, hit or miss. Sorry. That, that, no, thank you. That's great. So that there's an opportunity out there for people who want to start them. The fun yeah. leagues. Yep. So uh, I know, again, in the Palatine area, we've had it before where it's been Palatine, Arlington Heights, Barrington, um, Hoffman Estates, because you couldn't, one one town couldn't get it, but we you, you kind of got the three or four other ones. So you're traveling a little bit, but it, it, it was still meeting kids at a high level, but not the highest level. Great. Okay. Thank you. Good to know. All right. This is for Dr. Goldstein. Um, can and I know you talked about more meniscus with the knee, but can you walk on a sprained knee, or will that cause more harm? Um, again, I'm going to answer with Knuth, yes and no. It depends on where what the sprain is. Are we talking about a ligament within the knee? Um, a lot of times, if you tear your ACL, um, you know you can get back and start walking on that pretty quickly. We actually encourage physical therapy before even considering any surgery. But if you sprain, you know, if it's just a, if it's just a, a a, a mild sprain where you feel like, you know, hey, I kind of twisted my knee and, it, and everything feels stable and everything is structurally okay, I'm okay with walking on it. If you think that you really injured and it hurts a lot to put weight on it, that's when I would back off and, you know, get yourself a pair of crutches, get it evaluated because there are things, at least in terms of the meniscus, if the meniscus is torn and if it's flipped, um, we call that a bucket handle tear, those are things you don't want to put weight on. So, if you have any concerns, if it hurts you a lot when you're bearing weight, you really should get it checked out so a doctor can say, hey, um, you can walk on this or you can't. Okay, great, great, good answer. All right, back to Dr. Knuth. Is junior high too early for children to start to start specializing in one sport? Uh, in general, junior high for us is 12, 13, or 14, and the answers are the great majority of uh, children, our kids are pre-adolescent, and the answer would be yes. Uh, once you're skeletally mature, once you are a full-grown human, uh, then for us, it's probably your over-risk injuries are uh, less. Uh, so there can be some mature 13, 14-year-old women, um, but in general, girls are done growing 15-ish, boys 17-ish. So middle school, be careful, because usually you're dealing with children and not young adults. Got it. Um, and you mentioned taking time off from a sport, which is what you're saying. Don't specialize in one sport in junior high because you aren't, your growth rate is still growing, et cetera. Um, and you did mention that kids could play year round. So what you're saying is play at least two sports, maybe even three sports. So you're taking time off of one to do another. There is actually a an organization, I'm blanking on it right now, uh, but it's multiple college coaches and it's a lot of the football coaches who are active, who are now actively recruiting the three-star athletes in high school as a, sorry, the three sport athletes in high school, as opposed to the single sports because of the acquisition of skill sets. If you do the same thing for 10 years, you, you, that's what you do. Where if you were baseball, football, wrestling, you have other skills and those people have a higher upside to them when they get to the next level. Uh, so people are actively looking for the three, two, three sport athletes, not the year round specialization uh, when you get to the college level. Okay, well, that's good to know. Thank you. All right, this might be for either one of you. Is a shin splint the same as a stress fracture? I can go with that. There's something we call a medial tibial stress syndrome, and that's one of the, probably what they're talking about. And it starts off as inflammation of the bone, which is commonly layman's term shin splints. But if that progresses, the inflammation around the bone turns into inflammation in the bone, and then finally a crack in the bone. So it's a spectrum. Okay. Okay. Good answer. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Um, what do you do with a tear in the non-vascular area of a meniscus tear? You mentioned that you, it's best to try to work on the vascular area. What do you do if there's a tear in the non-vascular area, Dr. Goldstein? So again, you look at the meniscus, you, you'll see that in the MRI, but again, I'm looking at the patient. I'm looking at um, how long they've had these pathology for, if it's really bothering them. And so initially, depending on the age of the patient um, and how much the function, we either treat them conservatively first with 
injections, therapy, and medications, or potentially going to surgery. So if from a surgical perspective, if, if it's in a non-vascular area and I do not think it's going to heal, I'm, I'm usually doing what's called a meniscectomy and trying to trim it out. And the reason being is if I try to fix a meniscus that I don't think is going to heal, a lot of times I'll be doing um, a second surgery, pulling out my repair, because it's just not going to work. There's okay. been some recent there's been a recent push about trying to fix being a little bit more aggressive with meniscus pathology um, in terms of about trying to fix a lot more. But in general, that's a that's a, a general answer. And that's how I usually treat my patients. And and is it pretty standard where there is more vascular parts of a meniscus versus less vascular meniscus among all people? Or is it very person specific? No, it's 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 usually fairly standard that the back third is vascularized. So we talk about three zones of the meniscus. We talk about the red zone, which is the blood zone. That's the back third. We talk about the red-white zone. You can imagine because that's half blood and half and half non-vascular. That's the middle third. And then we talk about the white-white zone, which is the inner third. So that's pretty standard. Um, there may be some a little bit of variability, but in general, the back third is the best for vascular. Um, there's okay. a little bit in the a little bit in the middle third and not much in the front third. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yep. Um, this one's for Dr. Knuth. How important is sleep for the health of young athletes? Should young athletes sleep more than other kids? Uh, yes, uh, that's uh, sleep is extremely important. By no means am I a sleep expert, so some of it's going to be medical and some of it's going to be the father. Uh, but it is not atypical for our teens to be taking naps as opposed to truly sleeping at night. Um, and sleep just from a health issue, whether it's an athlete or a non-athlete, is, is a tremendous thing. But in general, from our standpoint, when somebody is out on the field expending a lot of energy, they're what we call catabolic, where they're basically breaking things down. And so much of our overuse comes from a lack of being able to build up or what we call anabolic. And anabolic stuff, the body builds up when it gets rest. The body builds up when it gets sleep and it builds up when it gets good nutrition. So we'll have some kids who are very, very active, but then they don't sleep, they don't eat well, uh, they're overscheduled, and that's just not a recipe for a good result. Okay, thank you. All right, um, when should you see a doctor for a sports injury? So that could go to either one of you. I would say um, if, if it's starting to limit you from what you're wanting to do, um, that's when you should see a doctor for a sports injury. So if it's starting to bother you and, and your activities that you like to do and it's limiting you, um, I would see someone for that. Okay, great. Great, thank you. All right. Um, do kids, this, so this is for Dr. Knuth, do kids, needs as, do kids need as much stretching before and after activity as adults? Uh, the answers are yes, especially during the growth years, uh, because in general, most, uh, you know, I'm 56 years old, so my body hasn't changed much. I'm pretty much static, um, so I'm not working against something. You'll have a 12-year-old turn into a 15-year-old boy, and there might be eight inches of growth uh, that happens over a, a three years. And with that, to me, bones tend to grow first and muscles tend to catch up. So even if they are stretching, sometimes all they're doing is keeping up with their growth and they're really not improving flexibility. So in general, the analogy I use is flexibility exercises are good for everybody and it's a lifestyle. It's a toothbrush. You brush your teeth to prevent the cavity. You stretch to prevent the injuries. More is, in general, always better when it comes to stretching. And the, and the kids who get the growing pains, uh, is that growing pains in their bones, in their muscles, in their tendons, or do we know? Uh, yes to everything. Uh, okay. In general for us, the growing pains usually to me is the four to six year old kid, and we're not really certain. Uh, but the the growth, sorry, the growth plate type stuff, we call apophysitis, that is the inflammation from overuse and usually growth activity, and flexibility are the issues uh, with with those kind of like the Osgood Schlatter or what we yeah. call apophysis uh, apophysitis. So that is that is a flexibility, growth, and activity related, not necessarily the four to six year old with growing pains that wakes up in the middle of the night, which we're still trying to figure that out as, in medicine. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. Um, as an adult with biceps tendonitis. How do I know when I've had enough rest to get back to lifting or if I'll just re-inflame my shoulder? 
That's for you, uh, Dr. Goldstein. Yep, yep, I, that's coming my way. Um, so biceps tendonitis, for other people who don't know, is pain in the biceps groove, it's in the front of the shoulder, and rotator cuff pain tends to cause pain on the outside of the lateral part of biceps in the front. And how do we treat that? You know, initially we treat that conservatively, um, anti-inflammatory medications, physical therapy, and potentially even trying a biceps groove injection, that's a cortisol injection into the groove itself. Um, and how do you know when you're getting back? Usually I'm treating these patients for, you know, four to six weeks with therapy and seeing how they're doing. They say, yeah, I feel pretty good. I feel 60%. May, I may try an additional couple of weeks of therapy, but once they're back to 90% and they're feeling pretty good, um, I try and let them get back to their activities. Is it possible you can get a re aggravation of it? It is. If it happens consistently and it just the conservative treatment is not working, there's a surgical remedy for it that's pretty quick where we cut that tendon and then we reattach it. It's called a biceps tendesis. And patients do very well from that and that helps with the pain significantly. Okay, great, thank you. All yeah. right. Um, what is the best way to avoid a frozen shoulder, which is kind of rotator cuffy related because it's shoulder? Yeah, that's okay. So again, I'm gonna give a one second description of what a frozen shoulder is. A frozen shoulder, is based the medical term is adhesive capsulitis and it's when you can't lift your arm up beyond a certain point and it just feels stuck every motion around your shoulder is just tight and you feel like you can't reach around for a female put the bra on or you can't reach overhead to get the dishes in, in it in a cabinet and so how do we treat that well the frozen shoulder real quickly is there's a spectrum and it could take up to nine months on a conservative basis to get better there's a first there's a phase where things get frozen and stiff there's a phase where things plateau, and there's a phase where things get better. The most common reason for getting a frozen shoulder is idiopathic, which means we don't know, it just happens. The most common demographic is middle-aged females, although men can get it too. And people who are diabetic or thyroid issues have them as well. You can get them after trauma, you can get them after surgery. How do we treat these? We treat this with physical therapy, ster oral steroids and injections. If after a few months things are not heading in the right direction, then there are things we could do called a manipulation under anesthesia, which is kind of put you to sleep for five minutes and break up those adhesions. However, if things are heading in the right direction, we can continue on that conservative route. And patients usually will, will get better um, either with, you know, letting time work its magic and, and, and therapy or doing what we call the manipulation under anesthesia. Okay, great. So if, if you don't have a frozen shoulder, but you start to notice maybe you have a limited range of motion, is it advisable to just start using that shoulder and, and try to increase your range of motion? That is an excellent, excellent question. And I think it's be really hard for the lay person to know if they're developing a frozen shoulder. I think an, an orthopedic doctor can, can tell you that. And the reason that's an excellent question is because if you're in the early phases of developing a frozen shoulder, that's it's counterintuitive, but I wouldn't try to push range of motion too aggressively because you could aggravate the shoulder, create, create an inflammatory situation where it would actually freeze or, or get tight quick, quicker. So we usually try to wait a little bit until that first phase is done if I really believe a frozen shoulder is developing. So as a personal trainer, if someone's coming in and they're getting limited range of motion, I send them to you rather than tell them to start moving more so you can see what phase they're in. Yeah, but you could also, yeah. you, would say, you would say, hey, um, has this been going on for four months or has this been going on for two weeks? You get a sense of the time pattern, right? So if this is like, this just started like two, three weeks ago, I'll be like, okay, let's back off. We'll give them some medicine. We'll give them some anti-inflammatories. Just rest that shoulder. And about, we'll wait about six weeks, four, six weeks, and we'll see where we're at and see if things have gotten worse or if they stabilized. And if, once that has happened, then we send them back to you and we get that shoulder moving then. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. All yeah. right. Let me see what else I've got here. Um, what are the chances of developing arthritis? following a meniscal tear another excellent question that's a that's a difficult question to answer on a specific level because it depends on a couple of factors number one how much of the meniscus are we removing and on which side of the meniscus so the load bearing structures are different on the inside part of your knee or your medial versus the outside and the meniscus has different properties so it really depends on how much meniscus is removed um, on which side and and do you have any pre-existing arthritis um, uh, already so again do you increase your risk for meniscus do you, sorry do you increase your risk for arthritis when you remove your meniscus you do but if the meniscus is not functioning if that meniscus is not functioning i'm not taking out any normal meniscus to begin with so right. you're only taking out meniscus that's already been damaged and it's not functioning so your risk for arthritis is already there but you try to limit um, how much meniscus you are removing 
Okay. Back in the day, I would say, back, you know, in the 60s and 70s, people used to take out the entire meniscus. And in and, and those days, people developed a lot of arthritis. We've learned from, you know, some of those um, mistakes where we, we try to limit the amount of meniscus that we take out now. Got it. Great. Thank you very much, both of you. Do either of you have anything that's popped into your heads following the questions that were asked where you went, oh, I also want to talk about this. And I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but sometimes when there are questions, it makes you think of something else that you might want to comment on. I hope you guys learned a lot. Uh, and, yeah, uh, I, I think yeah. I think we did. And uh, the people who came on have stayed on. So thank you for you know, obviously people are very engaged and interested in answering the questions that, that you're answering. And uh, I thought it was a great presentation by both of you. Thank you both so much. Appreciate your time and your effort. And we stopped just about eight o'clock. So hope we didn't take too much of your evening. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Albert Knuth and Dr. Jordan Goldstein for great presentations. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you much. Bye-bye.